If your idea of debugging CSS is toggling a few different things and maybe manually add in a few styles in the elements tab, then this video is going to blow your mind because I'm going to show you all the various advanced CSS techniques and debugging tools that I use, such as just massive overview that shows me every single thing wrong on my site. I can even use it to debug various contrast issues on my site. I have an animation scrubber where I could scrub through various different animations. And there are probably 10 other things that I'm going to show you in this video that will absolutely blow your mind and they make debugging CSS so much easier. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And in this video, I'm really gonna go from the most basic all the way to the most advanced features at the end of the video. So to get started with some of the basic ones, we're really gonna fly through them because most of them are probably things you already know. On any element, if you go to the elements tab and click on an element, you'll see this styles panel right here, which gives you a bunch of information, some basic and some quite advanced. The most basic information is it'll show you all the different styles being applied and you can toggle them on and off just by clicking on these check marks and you can even add your own styles such as I can add a bunch of padding on here if I want and now that adds a bunch of padding to my page and again I can toggle that on and off if I want. Another really nice thing about this is it shows you the order of these things being applied. So for example, if I scroll down here, you can see the display of block and the margin at eight pixels from the body are being overwritten by other styles that specify a margin and display up here. So you can see that they're being crossed out, which is a great way for me to determine what styles are being applied and which ones are being overwritten. But that's pretty much the basic use case everybody knows about this styles panel. So I wanna talk about a few additional things you can do. First of all, if you wanted to emulate different states, such as what happens when you're hovering on something or not, you can use this little hover panel right here. Just click on this section that says hover. And now you can say, okay, I want to emulate hover. And now essentially it's pretending like I'm hovering over this particular element. You can do the same thing by right clicking on an element, going to this force state section and toggling any of these that you want. Either way gives you the exact same behavior. But now essentially I'm emulating that I'm hovering on this particular element. But right now I don't have any CSS styles being applied for when I'm hovering over an element. So you can actually write your own CSS styles and add them directly into the style sheet. This little plus button right here allows you to write your very own style. So now I can come into here and I can add a hover state for this particular element and you can make the style whatever you want. And let's just come in here and change the background to red. So now when I'm, whenever I'm in that hover state, my background is red. And since I'm currently emulating that hover state, it shows up as red. If I unemulate that, you can see it goes back to normal. And now when I hover over my page, the background changes to red. So you can see I'm able to get that behavior just by clicking this toggle right here, which makes it easier to debug certain CSS things that require hover, because obviously you can't hover something and also be writing your code on the right-hand side of your screen. Another really handy thing that you can do is this little class icon right here. This allows you to add any new classes or toggle classes that are already on an element. For example, if I wanted to add a class called test onto here, you can see that adds the test class to this particular element. I can toggle this on or off. I can even toggle the original page layout class on and off, which really makes it easy for me to say, okay, what happens if I remove this class from this specific element? Does it change things like I want them to? Otherwise, usually what you do is you just say, okay, I'm gonna remove display grid from this element right here. That removes it from every single thing that uses that class. You can just come in here and toggle certain classes on or off to make it easier to debug specific things with one or two elements on your page. Now, the final little handy feature is something you can actually access other places, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. And that is this little paintbrush icon. If you click on this, you can essentially toggle between light mode, dark mode, and automatic. So if I change it to light, you can see it changes my theme to light over here. If I change it to dark, it changes to dark, or I can just have it set to automatic and it's going to automatically set it to dark mode. Generally, I just leave this whatever it is, but if I want to test between light and dark mode, I can easily toggle between those two different states. Now, another really useful tab that not a lot of people pay attention to is the computed tab. The computed tab not only gives you a very nice layout of what the box model looks like, so I can see how much padding, border, margin, as well as content space that my element is taking up, which makes it really easy. And if I go to a maybe smaller element on our page, for example, inside of here, let's just go to this section right here for the header. You can now see when I hover over this, it actually shows me here's the actual content section. And if I had padding, that would show up in green, border and yellow, and so on. So I can see all the different stuff going on inside my element. Now, the really nice thing about this is down here, I can essentially see all the different styles being applied to my element. These are the ones that are currently being overridden by my own CSS. But if I click show all, that essentially shows every single style that's being applied to this, even if it's a default one coming from the browser. And I can even group these styles based on different sections that they fall into. This is a really easy way to just overall look at, okay, what is being applied to this element? It's a little bit easier than going through this styles tab right here. And if you want, you can still come in here and you can actually see, okay, you know, my box sizing is coming from this particular section. My position is coming from this particular section on my page. And if you click on this, it brings you right to where that line is. So this is a great way of just getting an overview of what's going on inside of your page. 
And another really nice thing is when you hover over this, you can see where the element is on the left-hand side. Just like if you're in the elements tab, when you hover, you can see that on the left-hand side, as well as all the sizing information. Now, the last kind of basic section I want to cover in here before we move on to some of the more advanced things is this layout tab, which is one that almost nobody uses. But this is really nice because inside of your page, you may have a lot of different grid overlays, or if we scroll down quite a ways, you may see that we have a lot of different flex overlays as well. And I want to be able to essentially toggle certain things on and off to be able to see where these elements are, what the spacing gap and everything is between them. To do this is actually quite easy. We're going to use our navigation as a simple one. We can just click the check mark here. And now it's going to take that element, which is a grid. It's going to show us all the different rows and columns of our grid, which we have over here. And I'm just going to remove that style that I applied to the body just so we don't have to worry about that anymore. So we'll just toggle that hover state and we'll come in here. We'll just turn off that extra class that we made just again so we don't have that red color showing up. So now you can see that we essentially have all the different grid rows and columns showing up for exactly what's happening on that section of our page. And the nice thing, if I click on this particular icon, it brings me directly to that element. So now I can go into the styles tab and look at all the things for that particular element. And the really nice thing is you'll notice next to this in the elements tab, it has this grid button right here. I can actually click on that to toggle it as well. So you can toggle it from the layout tab or you can toggle it directly from here. And you can do the same thing with like flex containers as well. So I can come down here where this flex section is. I can toggle that on and now it's giving me information about the spacing between all the different elements in the flex container as well. For the most part, I use this a lot for grid because it's nice to see where my grid lines are showing up inside of my page. Flex is a little bit less useful in my opinion. Also with grid, you can come in here and you can toggle what you want to show. For example, we can hide those line numbers or show them. I find showing them is quite useful. You can also toggle to show exactly what the size of these things are based on your grid template columns and rows. And you can also show area names and extend the grid lines if you want. Extending the grid lines is really nice if you want to make sure certain elements across your page are all on the same like vertical or horizontal lines. This can make it really easy to see, okay, these things are lined up or not. So that's a really nice, useful feature. Now, we also want to talk a little bit about another tab here called DOM breakpoints. This is going to be very brief, but essentially you can add breakpoints to elements based on behaviors that happen in the DOM, which is great when you want to debug the CSS or something that determines based on different JavaScript features. For example, if I come into here, I can right click on this, scroll down to break on, and now I can break on subtree modification, attribute modification, or node removal. Node removal essentially means whenever this element is removed, it's going to completely stop my program right there so I can inspect what different things look like. This is useful for JavaScript, but also for CSS to see what happens when something's removed, how it looks on your page. The other most important one that you're probably going to use is going to be subtree modification. And this is really great for when elements are added or removed as children. So if you have a container and removing or adding a child does something with your CSS styles, you may want to add that breakpoint in there so you can see exactly what happens when you add or remove these elements. Really, really useful for those specific scenarios. And you can come in here and you can toggle them on or off if you want. Again, not super useful all the time because it's really good for JavaScript, but can be useful for specific scenarios. Now, everything else I want to talk about is actually going to be on completely different tabs than this element tab. And the first one is the rendering tab, which is a super underutilized tab. If you just type in or hold down control shift and then type P, that allows you to run different commands. And if you just search for rendering, that'll show you the rendering panel. And this rendering panel allows you to do a bunch of different stuff based on things that are happening on your page. I'm going to scroll down past these first couple because some of the most important ones are these emulation ones. These allow you to emulate various different CSS states that are otherwise quite hard to do. For example, you can emulate preferred color schemes to swap between light and dark. That's really great for that light dark mode toggle we talked about. You can also emulate, for example, a print screen to see what the print actually looks like for a page or the non-print version. You can emulate these forced colors. For example, you want to have different forced color stuff going on, or you can have a different preferred contrast. So if you want to have less contrast, more contrast, and so on, it'll allow you to determine what shows up on your page. Prefers remote reduced motion is probably one of the most important ones because now I can see what happens if this is toggled to make sure my animations and stuff are properly disabled. And we also have here prefers reduced transparency. Again, some people have a hard time with contrast, so having this reduced is important. And then lastly, we have this feature for the color gamut. This is really useful if you want to figure out, okay, what does this page look like at various different color gamuts? I have a full video, a absolutely massive video on CSS color and everything you need to know about it. And that'll go way more in depth into all these different color gamuts, but this allows you to easily toggle between the different ones. You can also emulate what happens on your page for specific things. So for example, for blurred vision, this is what my page looks like. And you can determine, is this a good look, a bad look? You can really figure out what you want to do. And you can do this for things like reduced contrast as well as different color blind features as well. I mean, this page is mostly black and white, so they don't show up that well, but this is a really great way to test. Okay, do my buttons actually work when someone is colorblind like red, green? If you have a red button and a green button, and that's the only way to tell the difference, you're probably gonna run into some various differences. Now, going back up to the top of the rendering tab, because these are all like emulation-based things, I I want to talk about various different things that you can enable as well. A few of them are really helpful for debugging different performance issues. For example, paint flash. By clicking on this, it'll highlight all the areas of the page in this like green color. 
whenever they need to be repainted. This is great to determine why things are changing on your page. Maybe something is really changing more quickly than you expect it to be on your page, or you're not sure what things are changing. This will kind of tell you what those different things are. Same thing here with layout shifts. This will highlight everything in blue that is being shifted around. So this is great to determine, okay, are things moving around more than they should be? This is a super useful feature. You can also show layer borders to determine different things for the layers on your page. For the most part, this layer borders is really not that useful though, because it's a super, super niche kind of advanced feature. Now, some other performance related stuff. Maybe you have a lot of animations on your page you may want to show frame rendering stats. That's essentially going to show you a bunch of information on the side about the performance of your page to determine if it's rendering too quickly, rendering too slowly, if there's certain drops in like your FPS and stuff that's going on. This is a great way to determine what's going on on your page, especially when you have lots of different animations. You can also do things with scrolling performance. So as you're scrolling your page, anything that shows up in a teal color means that it's purposely slowing down your scroll. So if you have like some JavaScript events running on scroll, that can cause some issues or animations based on scrolls. And then finally, these other ones not super important, but this one, emulate a focused page. This is incredibly useful because this means that now I'm essentially emulating that I'm focused on this page even when I'm not and I'm like focused in my dev tools, for example. This is great when you try to open something like a search menu or whatever and you start typing inside here and when you unfocus, it would normally close it. In this case, I don't think that actually happens. If I unfocus this particular thing, it stays open. But a lot of different select boxes, when you unfocus them, actually completely close themselves, which makes it really hard to debug the issues. Think about like a Shad CN type of tool. Lots of those selects will automatically close themselves. This makes it so that even when you focus on something else, it keeps it completely open for you. For example, here, if I focus away, this actually might be a case of it staying open. Yeah, it does stay open even when I focus away. But again, there's many different instances of things that close themselves when you focus away. So having this ability just to keep it focused when you move away is really useful. And I pretty much keep this enabled all the time. Now, the next really useful page I want to talk about is the animation page. So again, control shift P, just start typing in animation. You'll see this show animations right here. And you can scroll this up. And by default, it'll be completely empty just like this. But the nice thing is as you're going through your page, anytime that there's an animation that runs on your page, so we'll just scroll down quite a ways because these are all the way at the bottom, you'll see that as I scroll through the various different animations on my page, they show up on the right hand side. So let's kind of go up to some of these animations and take a look at what they look like. We'll go down to this second one here. There we go. And this is this animation right here. You can see when I click on it, it'll play through the animation. I can scrub through the animation to see what's happening at every single time point. I can play it at like 25% speed, for example, or even 10% speed to really fine tune what's going on in my animation. And I can even change the animation from here. So if I want this slide in to change, for example, I can just scroll that in. And now when my animation plays, you can see it slides in much faster than it did before. I can do the same thing here with this grow shrink. I can modify how that works. So now if we play through this particular animation, you can see that it has certain things going on inside of it. And let's just actually fix that back to where we had it. There we go. So this is just kind of a great way to be able to play through your animation and see what's happening at every single point in your animation. And the really great thing is once you want to actually take this animation and save your changes, you can just click on the element that you want to work with and it'll bring you over to the elements tab for that. And if we scroll this down quite a ways, we can see this element. And if we look over at the styles, we have all the different things that we changed being hard coded in this element style right here. So we can see all the different durations and stuff showing up right inside of there. Honestly, if you're doing any complex CSS animations, this is an absolutely crucial tab that you need to familiarize yourself with. And it's great because you can go through every single animation on the page, play through them, restart them, and so on. Now, the really important tab that I showed you at the beginning, that's called a CSS overview. This is a relatively new tab. It's been around for a little while, but it's still kind of experimental. So let's actually make this one full screen because it's a little bit easier to see what's going on in the full screen view. And all we need to do to be able to use this page is just click capture overview. What that's going to do is essentially going to capture a snapshot of your page of all the different CSS content on your page. So this top section essentially tells you all your different CSS selectors and things that are going on. So you can see we have 3000 elements on our page. We have 17 external style sheets. We have 318 different rules being applied. We have this level of selectors that are happening. We have 23 different media queries. So it gives you an idea of like, okay, am I using ID selectors? I probably shouldn't be. So if I see that number being really high, maybe I have a problem. Same thing with inline styles. Maybe you don't want those. Again, this will kind of give you an overview of what's going on, but it gets much more in depth than that. For example, there's an entire section on color. And this I find absolutely crucial because it's very easy to accidentally start implementing small variations of different colors into your site. And now all of a sudden you have like seven different green colors. So here you can look and see, okay, you know what? We actually have a really good color palette that's quite consistent. We only have seven different background colors and they're all relatively distinct from each other. If we look at our text colors, you can see here that for the most part, they're relatively distinct from each other. You can see that this red and this red are quite similar. These two purples quite similar. Some of these grays are quite similar. And that may be a specific design choice or it may be the fact of you just accidentally tweak some things, made them 
just slightly different than other variables in your site, and it would be better just to consolidate them into one single color, which would make it a lot easier to work with and debug your site. And something that makes this a lot easier is if you want to figure out, okay, where am I using this color? You can just click on the color and you can scroll up here and you can see this shows me every single element that is currently using this color. And if I want to go to that element, all I need to do is click right here and it brings me directly over to that element and I can scroll to where all these different color informations are being used. So this is a great way for debugging where all the colors on your site are coming from. It gives you background colors, text colors, it'll give you fill colors and border colors. And most importantly, it gives you a section on all the different contrast issues that you have. And again, I can click on any of these and it'll show me all the different elements that have that contrast issue. That one didn't seem like it loaded. Again, this is an experimental feature. This looks like it's working fine. You can see these are all double A contrast compliant, but the triple A contrast compliant is not there. And if I click on this, I can bring myself directly to that particular element on my page. I can see what's going on for that particular element. And if I wanted to be able to modify things, I can click right here on the color picker. And this actually shows me the contrast bands. I can expand this contrast ratio section and you can see these different bands. If I'm down here below both the bands, I don't have any contrast ratio. In between the two bands is double A and above the band right here is going to give me triple A contrast, which is the best possible contrast ratio. For the most part, as long as you have double A, you're probably fine. But triple A is really just that gold standard of what you get for making something that's contrasting really well. So the text is easy to see on the background. Now, if we close out of that and go back to the CSS overview, we can even see more things inside of here. So we have all of our color information, which is great. We also have information on all the different fonts being used on our page, as well as all the different font weights and how many times they occur. This is great to make sure that you're consistent in your fonts. If you have a font that shows up for like one or two sections on your page, that's probably not a good thing and you want to change that. So here we can see, okay, all of our font sizes are relatively consistent. We only have a few large ones and we have quite a few at this normal font size. Same thing here, we're relatively consistent with our font weights, but maybe we don't need to have 700 and 600 as a weight. Maybe we can combine them into one because that would make it a little bit more consistent and easier to work with. Same thing here, you can see all the different line heights that you're using across your application. And here you can see we're using Arial in six different places. This is honestly probably a mistake because we want to be using our actual font, which we're using up here, this inter font. So this Arial font is most likely a mistake and I can click on this and find where those different six elements are and change them if I want to. Scrolling back down to this, we can debug even further. You can see here I have this mono font, which makes sense, but I also am using this mono space font in 19 places. Most likely I probably want to use this JetBrains mono font instead. So I can click on this and find all the places where this is currently occurring. Another great feature is this unused declarations. This essentially just tells you any CSS feature that you've declared that doesn't actually do anything. For example, vertical alignment is being applied to elements that are not inline or a table cell, which means that it absolutely does nothing. And I can click on this to view all the different occurrences of it. So let's go to this the button, for example, and we can see if we actually search for that vertical alignment, you can see it's right here, vertical align middle, middle, but it's not actually doing anything because of the way that this element is currently being positioned on the page. So I could essentially remove this and my page would work exactly the same as before. The final thing on this particular page I wanna talk about all the way at the very bottom is going to be media queries. And again, this just shows you all the media queries you use. And sometimes you may have media queries that are very, very similar to each other. And you may want to consolidate them into one media query because sometimes having a lot of really inconsistent breakpoints is difficult to actually work with and debug. But for the most part, it's, you know, not too bad to have different breakpoints. Sometimes you want to have specific breakpoints, but this is just great to be able to figure out, okay, what are all the different breakpoints and everything I'm using for different media queries on my entire application. Now, the final really cool CSS thing that I want to talk about actually requires you to use a Firefox based browser instead of Chrome, but it's a very simple thing to check really easily. So I highly recommend enabling this. If we scroll over here, you need to go to the about colon config page. That's going to open up this giant configuration where you can search for various different things to change. And you're going to want to change your layout.css.font dash visibility. Normally, this is set to a value of three, which allows all fonts on your page to be rendered. This is fonts that are local to your browser. These are fonts that are being downloaded. And most importantly, these are fonts that the user specifically downloaded themselves onto their computer and installed. Usually, this is where you run into different font problems. If a user views your page and they say, hey, the fonts aren't loading for me, and then when you view it, you see that the fonts are loading fine, that most likely means you locally installed these font files, but you forgot to actually make them downloaded on the page by all the people that are viewing it. So if you change this to a value of one or two, that actually removes the ability for users to actually load or for you specifically to load fonts that are loaded on your computer. So now if I have a locally installed version of my custom font, it won't show that inside of Firefox and instead it'll fall back to whatever the default font is, which makes it very easy for me to look at my site and go, oh, 
I forgot to accidentally import and use this font properly. It was just using the one that was already installed on my computer, which is why it normally looked like it was fine, but it actually wasn't. So again, if you're having font issues on your page or even just before you deploy a page, I highly recommend going into Firefox, enabling this feature, going to your site and seeing if all your fonts load properly. If they do, you set up everything correctly. And if you didn't, that means you most likely incorrectly set things up in your fonts and you need to make sure you change that before you deploy your site. Mastering CSS takes much more than just debugging. So if you want to learn how to absolutely dominate colors in CSS and all the newest features in CSS, I'm going to link videos for both of those right over here. And with that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.